Hi. Thank you for quite a lot of interest from a number of forums, in particular a forum I'm responding to here called um, Slut Hate, as it happens. It's interesting to see how what I'm saying is spreading around the world and I guess it's natural that what appears to be relatively um, adolescent or young men are interested in what I'm saying. I think that would completely be um, what I'd expect. And I know it's not the type of site where most professionals such as me would actually spend the time to go and engage with people, but it's important to do so. Um, they have honest views and opinions and interests and it's important for me to try and develop that if we're trying to develop these concepts into the wider public consciousness. Um, so six people have made posts since I checked and started to make a response. I don't know if I'll do this again. I'm very sorry if people paste posts subsequent to this, but I felt that given the nature and number of posts, it would be simpler and easier for me to make a quick little presentation to answer your responses. Uh, the first response came from Incel Executioner. I do, I do love some of the names you've got here. Um, who thanks me for coming onto the forum, which is fine, we're here. He's saying the main question was about um, oral posture. Will do anything can adults because their bones are fully deformed and fused and fully developed and fused. And he asks me, he wants to see the cold hard evidence that posture in adults will be able to move the maxilla. Well, I don't have any cold hard evidence that we can move the maxilla up and forwards in adults, but I do have some very convincing evidence to suggest that it can go down. You can see on both these individuals, they've both had a cerebrovascular accident, so they've had a stroke. And what's happened with the stroke is it's caused one side of their face to drop down. Strokes are really good experiments of nature because they can show one side of the face unaffected from the other side of the face, so a split um, experiment. They can also show you someone who's already grown. So this is a fully grown person that's now had this problem. Of course, here's someone who's had some nerve damage um, apparently there wasn't a stroke, although I don't know the case history exactly. And you can see how that face has changed shape. Slightly less the maxilla, but it's gone down. And of course we've got Stephen Hawkin, who I've used before. He's a great example of someone who was relatively well grown when he was in his wedding where he got married. So he was fully grown then. And since then, you can see that maxilla's dropped all the way back and down. It almost looks like he has melted onto the headrest where he's resting, which is very much the concept I'm putting across, this melting into this position. Now, we are working on methods to move the maxilla up and forwards. I've got some excellent results in kids using exactly the same method that I'm implementing for adults. But as you say, it's not going to be easy. I don't pretend it is. It's something I want to achieve. It's not something I've yet achieved. I have enough people lining up wanting me to attempt it on them. And that's my next direction we're aiming in. Now, beat a gay face. Um, you asked about face pulling. Well, this comes on to the specific topic that I've just left. And asking about your own face pulling device, you say you'll put a picture of it. I'd love to see a picture of it. You say you're doing this 30 minutes a day before bed. Well, there is some controversy in this area. I always use a lot longer force levels. 
when I talk to Dean Howell and that group, they're using 30 minutes a day. When I question them closely on why they're using 30 minutes a day, they think that any more than that may cause problems with fusing up with the bones. That goes very much against orthodontic doctrine where bones move with slow, gentle forces as would be the posture of your tongue on the roof of your mouth for a predominant period of the day. So what I thought I would do would analyze these results as I go, looking at some of the people who wear the brace less compared to some of the people who wear the brace more. Of course, I'm still in fairly early days of constructing my head brace. I remade one on a child today because her face has changed so much that it didn't fit anymore. So in children, I'm getting great responses. She's only six years old and it's a big difference. She wears a lot of the day, at least 12 hours, if not 16 hours a day. Um, and as we develop this head brace, I'm sure we'll make improvements in the design and the technique. I also have some timers set within my head brace that are giving me some feedback, but that again needs a little adjustment. I need to calibrate the temperature that these timers are set for to get the right accuracy. Um, so, and you mentioned that the tongue is a gaining more or less the same effect. And I'd agree with you, and it's important to remember that if you're gonna do some face pulling, you're gonna to have to have something to support the effect you get. If you pull your maxilla forwards, something's going to have to hold it, which is only going to be your tongue. You can't do your maxilla's homework for it. Because if you do someone's homework for them, you have to do that forever. And in the same way, your maxilla has to be constantly pulled forward so that it maintains itself forward. Or you hold it there with your tongue. Now, the way I'm talking about my head brace, I would be interested to see what you're using for your face pulling technique. Um, I went all the way to deepest, darkest Tokyo. It was a hassle getting there to see um, Yasu Matani, who's come up with some concepts over there. So this is the head brace he's wearing. He's asking for 18 hours wear a day. And he showed me the only two adults that I felt had got a really good change in their facial shape. It wasn't so much the maxilla had come up. It was so much the back of the jaw had come up. So you had an auto-rotation of the mandible. So the maxillary back, maxillary of the teeth had lifted up to allow that auto-rotation. And he said it was because of this back lifting here. So he's lifting the back of the maxilla up and that's causing this auto-rotation of the mandible. And it was interesting, he showed me one of the results he gained was actually a dentist. So again, he's got one dentist has changed and one non-dentist has changed in adults. So it's meaning it's possible, but he's using 18 hours a day. Then um, this lady came into my clinic some time ago using the head brace designed by um, Dean Howell when he was working with Amir. Um, my concern with this, it's got the right direction of force pull it's going in the right direction, but she could only wear this about 15 minutes a day and it becomes uncomfortable. Well, I think you need it for longer than that. I stand to be corrected, but I think you're going to need it longer. And this sort of brace, is, this device, is going to be a little bit big to sleep in or do anything like that if you need to wear it more of the time. Oh, don't know what happened there. So this is the head brace I've been designing. This was one of the early attempts to design it. I now have it set much further back on the head. But what you have is you have it uh, pulling up here and then pulling forward at the front there. If I switch that light off, you can see that a little bit clearer. You, there's an elastic pulling here that I guess, yeah, is difficult to see from here. But you've got those two forces. And the concept is you have the pulling up there and you have the pulling forward. So you have the two forces and then mathematically calculating how both of those force vectors interact. We get this force vector moving upwards and forwards, but that's the desired force vector. 
but also we're lifting the back of that maxilla up, which is going to allow that mandible to rotate forwards by basically taking the door stop out so that we can get that rotation forwards. And here is it more readily, uh, the, the, the finished product for a younger child. Um, she's got some great facial changes. Not the best I've had, the other one was the best I've had. Um, now, um, BB wrote in his, um, thank me for coming and giving this discussion and forgive the comment about my hairpiece well whatever mate this is the internet don't worry about it although maybe not pictures of my child on the facebook page, or this page would be nice thank you very much um now he's asking me if the um, teeth need to be in contact so do we need to be biting our teeth together and i think no we shouldn't be biting our teeth together i think that we've missed out on the tongue as an agonist of the jaw biting muscles. When I look at all of my body, every single limb, every single bit of skeletal muscle there is, seems to have an antagonist, a muscle working against it. So if I move my finger in one way, there's another uh, muscle to move it in the other way. And in that way, all our skeletal muscle on, on our bones is built up with a muscle in one direction, another muscle in another direction. The exception to this rule seems to be the mouth, where we have muscle to close, but we have no muscles to open it. I mean, you do have muscles underneath the jaw, but I don't think those are really applicable. And what we would have in the, the there is a, sorry, a mechanism called the shot reflex. Uh, this comes from the days gone by when a lot of pheasants and wild birds were caught by being by buckshot, as you say in America, or shotgun, as we say in the UK. And the risk of eating this very tasty meat was that you would come over a little bit of lead in your food. And your masticatory system that's exerting large loads with very little freedom of movement will stop, bang, on this bit of lead in the mouth, between the teeth. That mechanism is a feedback from the overloading of teeth. And that seems to be the only mechanism now that stops us biting too hard. And when we add up the individual loading capacity of each of the teeth, it comes to a far too higher amount. And it allows people to approx very, very hard, exerting huge forces through their head for what is still only one, maybe two hours a day, so the body doesn't really ever get used to it. And I think a lot of migraineous headaches and things happen when you've got your teeth in contact and you're biting like that. What you really need is your antagonistic muscle pushing against that. You need your tongue up on the roof of the mouth to balance the jaw biting muscles. Now I've mentioned this slightly in my latest article, there's a plug, called craniofacial dystrophy. It's in the British Dental Journal. It's, it's open source, so you can go and have a little look at it. Um, so when I make a diagram of this, I've got, this is just diagrammatical representation of the jaw moving up and down, but you have the tongue pushing down and the biting forces pushing up, and this helps them to balance it, which means the tongue is a unique muscle. It's one of the only muscles in the body that is unattached at one end because you need to eat so the food needs to go past so it needs to become detached to allow the food to come past and then to reattach itself but it's pushing up forming the whole mid face and of course without that pushing up you don't develop your mid face and of course when most of us were developing our proprioception or our posture we were standing up at about one about anywhere from 10 months to about 14, 16 months, you stand up and you start to walk. And as you do that, you program your postural centers. I can recognize people I know from their posture. So it's a very reproducible, um, fairly set thing in people. But as you stand up, you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and you maintain your oral posture and the drivers of what develop your face. Well, the most of us these days, 
are having long periods, sometimes as little as a day, but often two to three days long of having a blocked nose. And you have a choice if you have a blocked nose. You either die or you drop your tongue down and breathe out your mouth, which can become a habit. And most of us, when we were develop our posture, were walking around like this. Now, I know it's possible to change that. And I know that because if I'm in my car and I'm driving along and someone jumps out in front of me, I put my foot down on the brake. Now, I, was, I, was, I didn't, was, wasn't born with that programming. I've learnt that program. That's a conditioned reflex response. Now, if we can condition our tongue to be on the roof of the mouth, surely we can change it. But so teeth not together, biting together, they should be a fractionally apart, but we should have this beautiful gliding, balancing system that allows this to happen naturally without us having to stress about the teeth being in contact or not being in contact, and becoming a bruxist, where our teeth are too much in contact, being balanced by that shot reflex. It's not the shot reflex, it's the tongue as an antagonist. Then um, I had a a question from Kushmaster. Um, can you not maintain a normal tongue position if you breathe through your mouth? Oh, sorry, his question was, um, yes, proper breathing. Can he use um, superhuman techniques? Oh, sorry, I'm missing it. With proper breathing techniques, can an ugly subhuman creature become a model? Thank you for your time. I think it's going to be more than breathing techniques. And I say why, is you can maintain a normal tongue position if you breathe through your mouth. You cannot if you breathe your mouth. If you're going to breathe through your mouth, you have to drop your tongue down. So it's important you breathe correctly. But if you have a um, poor tongue position, you can still breathe through your nose. So people with good breathing, you can have a great breathing, breathing through your nose, but your tongue can be down here. So you could have a good tongue posture, good um, breathing, perfect breathing, like this. And that's not enough. I think the breathing affects the tongue posture, which is how the breathing can affect facial development. But it doesn't necessarily work in the other direction. So you, you could if you use the posture and muscle function. But those are the two biggies, posture and muscle function. Um, now, robust. Now you're asking if your jaws are not recessed, can you improve ramus growth and eventually the mandible angle, which is good use of terminology. And my answer is yes, but it takes time and effort. And I'll run through these slides. This boy was in our treatment, but our treatment only lasted that long. I then got him to wear one of our training braces for the rest of the time. And remember, a training brace is doing nothing more than each time you drop your jaw down, it's reminding you to keep your jaw together. That's it. It's just reminding you. It's a passive appliance. It does very little. You could do that yourself. So it's possible. And it's possible to go from here to here, which I'm guessing is the type of change you want to achieve. And I'm a little bit concerned with some of the cons your um, comments under your um, name at the bottom. A little bit, you know, scary. <coughs> but this is a site not for professionals. And then final one, um, Jorg Brenner. Um, you're saying you've been doing uh, this technique for a couple of weeks now. And you're asking, I've got a, a before and after pics of clients doing it just for three to six months with motivation. Um, 
I don't, you, you know, it's very hard to define these things. I mean, I didn't notice I'd changed at all until my um, present partner, who I've just had a child with, was going through my old photos. And she said to me, look, you, weren't, you didn't look as good, you know, my, in my old photos. I did notice the same effect on all of the dental nurses I've worked with, but it's quite subtle. It's not something that's easily depicted in a picture. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's, you, you're going to need more time to do something like this. It's got to be a lifestyle choice, and I equate it the same type of thing as losing weight on a permanent basis, giving up smoking, becoming more buff. You know, it, it's a tough thing to do permanently. And lots of people will have a go, make a little bit of a difference, and then slack off rather than constantly going. But you do notice how people's faces change over periods of time. Some people, there's often individuals, examples of people who change. Uh, there was something in the papers about people going to Afghanistan, how it was changing their face. Well, I think that's not unlikely, given what I'm saying. But that's a deep psychological change in these people. And I've seen some people going into uh, city jobs where they have to work long hours every day and it's high stress and they get a more jowly, strong jaw. Um, and you see other people who seem to, you know, not do well in life and their faces seem to melt away as they, uh, whatever, what's ever happening. So I think it, it's as hard as gaining a personality change to gain these changes and it needs that combination of the change in the muscle function or uh, well, the muscle effect, I don't think we've come to a real definition there, and a change in the tongue posture. And these two things are vitally important, as is just standing up straight. You know, having a good posture. So not being here, trying to get your tongue in the roof of your mouth, but being up here. Chin tuck. Look up the Mackenzie chin tuck. A, I think he was a physiotherapist from New Zealand, but he was on the same sort of lines. Lots of people have been on similar lines. I don't think all of them have already put the whole thing together and come up with a definitive concept and idea or pushed it as hard as we are to try and get it out there in the um, public consciousness, which is what this is all part of. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to ask me some questions. I hope